So that's the title of the sermon. I'll come back to that, The Never-Ending Story. And that will make sense as we go. But I want to tell you a story about an Uber driver. Raise your hand if you've ever been in an Uber. Okay, so most of you know what Uber is. Most of you have been in an Uber. Well, there was a, a gentleman that was new to the whole Uber game. He was an Uber driver. And he decided that he would try to make a living as an Uber driver. He got his first passenger uh, in his car. And he began to take this gentleman from point A to point B. Well, the passenger decided that he wanted to strike up a friendly conversation with his Uber driver. And so he leans forward and he taps the guy on the shoulder to strike up a conversation. And it startled the Uber driver. And he went, ah! And he was just really, you know, startled. And so the passenger decided, I guess I shouldn't interrupt my Uber driver when he's doing his job, so I'll just back off, not strike up the conversation after all. So the ride takes place, they get to their destination. The passenger says to his Uber driver, I'm so sorry. I mean, I did not mean to startle you like that. I'm sorry I tapped you on the shoulder. I did not mean to interrupt you. He said, no, 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 I'm the one that's sorry. My apologies. This is my first day as an Uber driver. You gotta understand something. I've been driving a hearse for 25 years. Um, <laughs> And when I, when I read that story this week, I, I practiced that joke on my daughter that's 12. She said, Dad, what's a hearse? So um, when I explained it to her, she laughed and said, oh, you should definitely tell that joke to begin your time. Um, but the story actually reminded me of Easter. You're going to see in a couple of moments when we read the story, some women that are startled like the Uber driver. They are understandably afraid, and they're going to need to be told by Jesus and an angel, don't be afraid. I know that a dead person is now alive, and that makes you a little bit scared, but it's also so, supposed to make us all very excited. So that's the goal this morning. I thought about this guy. That's Billy Graham. Look at his nice white shoes there. Um, my son's name is Graham because one of my heroes is Billy Graham always will be because I read a book when I was in college called The Secret of Happiness and I wasn't very happy. And when I picked it up and, and Billy Graham contended that Jesus holds the keys to happiness, it changed everything for me. So now I have Graham who's 14 named after Billy Graham. Well, that was Billy Graham's most embarrassing day. Did you know that? He was 31 years old. That's the first time he ever got invited to the White House and he blew it. That's a staged photo that the media wanted. And so he's like, yeah, yeah, let's get this in the press. 31 years old, you can understand that he would make a mistake. He made the day more public than uh, President Truman wanted it to be. He overstayed his welcome in the White House. He stayed longer than his allotted time. Uh, not only that, he, he leaked to the press private conversation that he had with the president. And then when he gets outside on the lawn, they ask him to stage this picture and it ends up on the cover of Time Magazine. And you know what President Truman said? Understandably, after this, that guy's a fraud. That guy's motives aren't pure. He just used me for a publicity stunt to make his whole ministry more credible. And Billy Graham felt so ashamed of himself, he profusely apologized. They eventually worked it out and became friends. Uh, but I thought about that story and I thought about, you know, the... Uh, the, the moment of Easter and how many of you, we got to be honest about the reality of today. We've got another service. We normally just have one. The reality is church metrics, this church, no different than any others. We'll have more people here today, like Christmas Eve and Easter, more people than we'll have the rest of the year. And so what that does is it makes me want to make a good impression on you and not blow it. And there's a, there's a little bit of pressure. One of my friends just asked, is Easter harder to preach than all the other Sundays. And the reality is, it is a little harder to preach because I know some of you, uh, this isn't your home church, and, and I know that some of you are visiting, but I wanna be honest with you in light of all of this about my motives this morning because this story kinda helped purify my motives, this story about Billy Graham. And I wanna tell you what my motives are. The first thing I wanna tell you is there's no place I'd rather be than right here with you. This is the church I wanna be in today in Boulder, Colorado, at Grace Commons with you. I am so thankful that God called us here and there's not another church. I don't wanna meet with a president uh, as much as I wanna meet with you. That's the truth. And if I don't know you, I would be uh, disingenuous if I didn't tell you that I want you to come back. I don't want this to be just kind of a visit. And I feel like I should just put that out there, that every person that's in a role like mine 
if I care about you at all, I don't just want you to come and have a great experience today. I want you to begin a relationship with Jesus and have a church family to call your own. So that's one of my motives. But I also want to reason with your mind and your heart because there's nothing in life that I want more than for you to believe in the resurrection. I don't know what your motives are this morning. You might've just came to get a, a great family picture. It's the one Sunday that you can get your kids to dress up with you. Or maybe the Easter egg hunt, just kind of the tradition your family brought you. And, and so you're kind of always gonna go to church on Easter. Whatever your motive is, I'm just glad you're here. I don't really care what your motive is other than to say, I'm just grateful that you've chosen to spend this special Sunday with us. Uh, and what I wanna tell you uh, is, is that this sermon, we're gonna read the text here in just a moment, but I wanna begin to share with you the motives of Jesus. And so the first thing I wanna say uh, before we even read the story is that I'm so blessed every year when I read about who got the news first. Now, if you were gonna be Jesus and you were gonna start a movement that would change the world, uh, you would probably want to be, if you're me and you, we would sit down and strategize who should get the news first? Well, I thought about what my daughter might say, Corey, who's 12. She would say, Dad, that's an easy one. Jesus should go, if, he, if it were to happen today, he should go right to Taylor Swift and have her tweet about it, <laughs> right? Because then the whole world would know if Taylor Swift got on stage and said he's risen, right? Well, Jesus, this is one of the things I love about him. And as I begin to reason with your mind and heart about why this guy is worth your life, the people that he chooses to reveal himself to first are stunning and it's beautiful. The, the one character that is mentioned in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these are the four accounts of the life of Jesus. There's only one character that's mentioned every time and her name is Mary of Magdala. And if you've been to Israel, uh, you will get to take a ride over the Sea of Galilee. And if your guide is a good one and, is under, and understands his geography, he would tell you that in the southwest corner of the Sea of Galilee, there's a little town called Magdala. And you don't stop there. Why? Because there's nothing there. It's just a little stinky fishing village. But there was a woman that was very close to Jesus, and she was from there. And all we know about her, really... We know from the resurrection accounts, because she's mentioned in all four accounts of the resurrection, but we also know that Jesus delivered her from, four, from, from seven demons. Now, I don't know what a person looks like or acts like when they're demon-possessed. I realize that's not my specialty, uh, but I know that you're not in your right mind when you're possessed by seven demons. And Jesus set her free from that. But she's a nobody from a nowhere village and Jesus loves her so much that he is going to choose to make her the first eyewitness of the resurrection. That should tell you something about how much he cares about you and me. You know, he, he didn't go. He could have gone to Pontius Pilate and said, hey, start the movement. He could have gone to the important people of the world. But he chooses to reveal himself to his very special friend, Mary, and some other women. And so um, what I think is only appropriate in light of this. The fact that the men were behind locked doors, scared. I mean, the men were not about to show their faces as Jesus followers, but the women show up at the tomb, his special friends, one of them being Mary of Magdala. So I asked my special friend, Debbie Caracella, to read this story. It just seems more appropriate to me that a woman be the one to read this narrative to us in light of the fact that Jesus revealed himself to some very special women. So open your Bible, if you will, to Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10. Ooh, I'm not. Oh, yes, I am. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm going to read this. Hope you have your Bibles open. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and another Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and they became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. 
he has risen. But just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him. They clasped his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. The word of the Lord. Amen. So what we're going to do with that story is look at the motives of the four characters of Easter. We're going to look at their motives and uh, and what each person is motivated by, starting with the women. Now, I want to show you this slide because Robert Downey Jr., we all know, he just won an Oscar. He's Iron Man. But if you really study the history of his career... He was really, his life was a mess. Not that long ago, I don't remember what year it was, he had to go to rehab. And he was not maybe long for the world even. When Mel Gibson got a hold of his life. And he said, Robert, I'm gonna gonna love you back to life. And he says, in a a speech not that long ago, Mel Gibson made some mistakes, made some anti-Semitic remarks. And Robert Downey Jr., when he was winning an award a couple years ago, said, you know what, Hollywood, I need you to forgive this guy. Because he forgave me when I really needed somebody to believe in me and love me enough to help me kind of reclaim my life. And he said he taught me how to hug the cactus, which is to to learn to love the unlovable parts about myself. And he went on, and I I thought about this. (coughs) The motivation of Mary Magdalene is kind of like that. Part of the reason she shows up at at the empty tomb is because Jesus delivered her from being a mess. And you don't forget the people that help you when you're lost and you're just way out there. Jesus loves her back to life. So that's part of her motivation. But part of the, the early objections to Christianity, this is a guy named Celsus. And part of the objection to Christianity, but it just says so much about Jesus. This was a philosopher and he said, you know, I object to the resurrection on the fact that females are the first witnesses. Hysterical females. They're not even allowed to testify in the court of law. Now today, it wouldn't be a big deal at all. We would affirm male or female, anybody witnessing in the court of law, but it wasn't the case in Jesus' day. But friends, Jesus is the standard. He doesn't follow the standards of the world. He wanted to honor his female friends, so he was going to show himself to his female friends, even if the people like Celsus say, Jesus was resurrected, says who? Historical, histrionic females? And so, But Jesus doesn't care what philosophers say because he loved Mary Magdalene and she loved him. And so uh, the first characters, their motivation is simply to come look. Did you notice that? In this text, we kind of get a little bit more about their motives in other texts. But in this text, all the text says about the motivation of the women is that they just came to look at the tomb. Now, this reminds me of... um, uh, a certain tomb that I've seen, that's JFK's tomb. If you've been to DC and if you've been to the Arlington Cemetery, you know, everybody goes to see where JFK is buried, right? You just go look at it. Some people that really love the president might put flowers there. This reminds me of my grandmother. When I lost my granddad, when I lost my dad, she was still alive. Almost every day she had to stop by the cemetery in Austin to just put flowers, to just visit the tomb. Now that's love. Now these women, They are motivated simply by love. They show up at the tomb. In this particular account, they don't have spices or anything. Matthew just wants to say, wants to give you a picture of some women who just love Jesus. And they're just there to pay their respects. They the text tells you earlier that they actually could be sure that they were at the right tomb because they watched him go into it. These specific women. And they love Jesus. Now, before we move on to the motivation of the angels. I do just wanna give you this encouragement. If you were to come back to Grace Commons, long-term, if this were to be your church and all of you who do go to this church, I just want you to know, the thing that I long for in your life and in mine is simply that we would all love Jesus. Not religion, I don't want your 
money. I don't want to spoil your fun. I don't want to change your political views. What do I want? I want you to love Jesus like these women do. That's it. I think being a Christian really is as simple as that, to love him and to want to do what he wants you to do with your life and to walk with him and to love him. These women give us a picture of the true motivated heart of the Christian, simply a relationship with Jesus that would make you show up at his tomb and say, I just came to pay my respects to the person that I love. Now let's move on to the angel. The angels had their own motives, or, or this one angel has his own motive. Now I just want you to notice that he sits on the tomb. That's really interesting. He rolls it uphill. The, if you really parse the text out, that tomb had to be rolled into place, kind of downhill, and, and an angel comes, an earthquake happens, the tomb gets kind of thrown out of the way. <coughs> it has the seal of the Roman Empire on it. And it's not coincidence that the angel sits on the seal. Now, I was taught in seminary that if you really want to understand a passage, you've got to look at what comes before it and after. So we'll talk about what happens before this text and after. A lot of it is about the Roman Empire and about the religious leaders in Israel and, and how now God is sending a message, hey, now that the resurrection has happened, I just want you to know that my angel, he wouldn't have been intimidated by the Roman Empire because the guards, they fall like they're dead men at the sight of an angel, one angel. And so Jesus wasn't killed by the Roman Empire. God surrendered his son to atone for your sin at the hands of the Roman Empire. But now God wants to send a message. When I send my angel, he sits on the seal of, of, the, of the stone in front of the tomb, meaning he's not intimidated, nor am I, by what happened. Now I want you to see that God has triumphed. That's part of what's happening. But that's not all. The angel, when, when a person sits down, I want to show you this image. That's one of my favorite Broncos on your left. That's Steve Atwater, Hall of Famer. And that's Peyton Manning on the bench. Now, the, I, I've heard it said that if you wanna stop guys like Peyton Manning, what you need to do is get him there. Like, keep him off the field, right? Because when a person sits down, like when an athlete is on the bench, he's no threat, right? So the angel doesn't want these women to be scared. When he sits down, he's like, look, I know it's scary, that, uh, that I'm here right now, but the reality is this day isn't about me. That's really part of what the angel was trying to say. This, this day isn't about me. I, I had a friend text me this morning saying, man, go crush it. I said, yeah, it kind of feels like a game day, Easter. He said, yeah, go throw a no-hitter. And I thought to myself, Jesus threw the no-hitter. No That's not my role. My role is to kind of be like Jim Nance at the Masters, right? To just narrate what he did. And that's, that's sort of what the angels are here to do. They come and they look like lightning. And their clothes are icy white. And the, and, and the women are afraid. And the Roman guards are even more afraid. But the angel has one simple motive. And the motive is this. Just to tell the story of what happened. And he does say some things that are that are important, he sits down and he says, go to Galilee because that's where he told you that he was gonna meet you. And we'll come back to that. But the last thing the angel says is, there you will see me, now I've told you. He's kind of like an attorney that serves papers here. That's what angels are. Hey, I'm just a messenger, now you've been told. And I do wanna, before we move on, I do just want to say, make sure you know that the angels have told you the truth about Jesus, that we are all now accountable for our response to this truth of the resurrection. When the angel says, now I've told you, it was his way of saying, I'm going back to heaven now. I did my job. Now it's up to you whether you're going to do what you've been told, which is to go, like he said, go to Galilee and you're going to meet with him there. So the, the motive of the angels is to remind all of us that we do have a responsibility to respond to this good news, to, to take it to heart. Uh, next, the guards. I just want to briefly talk about them. Um, the motivation of the guards, they fall like a possum playing dead. I actually, in Albany, Texas, I found a possum in a trash can of our church outside in the backyard of the church. And I went to grab my kids and I was like, kids, there's a possum. I don't know if you've ever seen one, but we can go look at the possum. I dump out the trash can, the possum does exactly that. I'm like, oh dang, the, the possum's dead. I didn't know it was a real thing that like playing possum is like, 
a real defense mechanism. So the, the possum's laying on the ground, I go get my kids, and by the time I get back, what happens? It's gone. My kids are like, Dad, you're a liar. There's no possum. I'm like, he was here. I saw him. Well, at the sight of the angel, the Roman Empire falls dead. Did you see that? I mean, they're playing possum. They're just hoping that they don't get struck dead by this angel. They are terrified of one angel. Remember what Jesus said to Peter? Put your sword away. You think my dad couldn't dispatch a whole legion of them if he wanted to? No. I've come to lay down my life. If I wanted to fight, they would stand no chance. But these guys, they're scared to death. But what I want to point out to you before we close is, again, going back to seminary, they teach you what comes before a text and after is how you really understand what it says. This is what happens after this text. These guys take money to hush the story. They come back to the religious leaders. Before the story, you know what happens? The religious leaders come to Pilate and they say, you know, this guy said he was going to be resurrected. We know it's not true. We really, we don't want them to say that they are going to steal, you know, we don't want them to, the, the disciples to come steal the bodies and so we need to seal the tomb. Pilate says, make it as secure as you know how. So they secure the tomb. After this story, the the guards come back and they say, this is what happened. And the religious leaders say, we're going to pay you some money to hush this story. Put the blame on us if you get in trouble for it. And I want to say, isn't that interesting? Because they didn't even want to know the truth. Their motivations were impure. It reminds me, a famous Bible scholar once was listening to a debate on a college campus between a, a, a Christian and an atheist. And, and, and this scholar, this author was listening, and the Christian provided some like archeological evidence in favor of Christianity that would make you trust your Bible more. And so the evidence comes you know, out and it's pretty compelling. And the Christian author that's kind of in secret, just kind of taking this all in, says somebody next to me who was another kind of scholar that was kind of an opponent of Christianity, whispers to him, just give us some time and we'll disprove that. And the Christian author scholar thought to himself, isn't that interesting? You don't even want it to be true. Like your presuppositions, your motivations are closed up to it before you even consider the evidence. You know what Pilate should have done? Pilate should have said, if he raises, if, if he gets up from being dead, I will abandon my post in the Roman Empire and we'll all go follow him. Get away from me. And the, Israel, the, the Israelite leadership should have said, are you kidding? He got up from the grave? And the guards... They should have said, keep your money. Something has happened and we gotta figure out what it means. But friends, if your motivation is off about the resurrection, you're never gonna get there. You gotta be honest about the presuppositions you come in to considering the evidence of this. 500 people saw it. In the court of law, you just need like a few witnesses. And the 11 disciples, all of them were killed for this truth about seeing Jesus physically alive after his death. Now, you don't have to believe it happens all the time. You do have to believe once upon a time, God sent one son to atone for your sins and that he got up out of the grave because the grave couldn't hold the one that God sent because he didn't do anything wrong, right? He was the one that threw a perfect game. So make sure that your motives are in sync with uh, what God wants. Now, if you have uh, challenges with evidence and you need more proof, I did buy this book for our church bought this book for any of you that would like to go on this journey, an honest journey. This guy was, worked for the Chicago Tribune, Lee Strobel, and he was an atheist. He was a skeptic. And he went on a search, and he went and interviewed scholars, I mean, honestly seeking a case for Easter. And these are a free gift for you. If any of you would like to have a copy, we just have them at the back. You can grab them. Would love to give you this gift. And then I'd love to have lunch with you if you have questions about it. Anybody on our pastoral staff would love to do the same. And finally, the worship team would come up now. We're going to go back to singing, but now let's close by looking at the motivation of Jesus. This is the best part. What are the motives of Jesus here? Well, I love how this kind of transpires. First, just notice what Jesus says to these girls. You know, part of me wondered this week, why did he need the angel to tell the story when he himself was going to be there? He's like hiding behind a tree. 
I think part of this is the sense of humor and the playfulness of Jesus. He lets the angel tell the story, I think in part because those guards needed to go back and tell the Roman Empire and tell the Jews what had happened, but he wasn't gonna show himself to them. And so he waits for all that to kind of blow over, and then he kind of steps out from wherever he was, hiding, I guess. And you know what he says? Hi, girls. <laughs> Buenos dias. <laughs> it's really what he says. Buongiorno. Uh, hi. And they go right for the feet. That's a great strategy when you meet Jesus. Go for the feet. That's what I'm doing. I'm not going to hug his neck. I'm going for the feet first. I'm going to let him tell me, give me a hug. Because he's worthy of worship. And that's exactly what they do. But you need to know, he called this shot. And that's part of this story. Babe Ruth, 1932 World Series, I think it was. Two strikes. Crowds heckling him. He's in Chicago. And he said, you know where I'm going? Right there. Center field. He called the shot. The way that the angel tells the story is reminiscent of the fact that Jesus actually said these words. On this night, you, all of you are going to fall away. Look at the end. But after I've risen, I'm going to go ahead of you into Galilee. So what does the angel come to do? He told you. I don't know why you're here. He told you to go to Galilee. He called the shot. He told you this was going to happen. And so the next sermon series, friends, is actually going to be about things like this. How do we know that we can trust the Bible? The next sermon series is going to be called The Never-Ending Story. We're going to spend four weeks, and all of you are invited, to come these next four weeks to consider the evidence of a trustworthy Bible. How do we know that what they wrote back then is what we have now? And looking at deep questions in order to help you grapple with the concept of the fact that God has given us a library of books. So I hope that you will come back. But the best part, I don't know if you think the, ro you know, the royal family in England is cool. I do. I think it would be cool to be born into that family. But I'm a football guy. I think that family's pretty cool too. <laughs> um, and so my school, University of Texas, we have a Manning, and we think it's pretty cool to have football royalty on our campus. But listen, what Jesus says at the end here, look at this. Go tell my brothers. You know that's the first time he makes a family reference to anyone? Because it's finished, don't go tell my disciples. Go get my brothers because now we're family. Friends, there's no such thing as family envy for a Christian. We're in his family, if you believe in the resurrection. We get a seat at his table forever. We get, because Christ lives, we all are gonna live forever. If you believe it in your heart, that promise is yours. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the resurrection. Thank you for this truth. Father, um, Help us not to just believe it with our heads, but to believe it with our hearts. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.